welcome to a time of celebration and worship and grieving together. And on behalf of this family, uh, Sarah's dear family, uh, we just express our love for you and our love for Sarah. Uh, and she's part of our lives and always will be. Her roots go deep, don't they, into our lives. And we can only imagine the welcome that Sarah received in heaven. Um, we can't comprehend that, but for those who are in Jesus Christ by faith, we will be there and we'll catch up soon. Um, Psalm 116 has this verse in it, and this is from God's perspective. We might not be there yet. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful saints. Why would that be? Because it's a homecoming to God, coming home to God, which is our true place. Here we're alien, we're foreigners, this place is broken. Um, and it just got worse. But to be in heaven is wholeness. And finding our wholeness in Jesus in this life is what life is truly all about. That's what it was like for Sarah. So we gather to pay our respects, to give her honor, to grieve and to comfort together as community and as family and as friends. We, we will hear some stories, I guarantee that. Sarah was a storyteller. One of the things I learned from Sarah, even more recently in the last year, is to celebrate the little things. She was a celebrator. Um, she was always excited about something and giving God praise for something that was going on in her life. Um, so Sarah lived her full life, rich and abundant life in Jesus Christ. When she accepted Jesus, it changed everything. And I want to extend that to you to, to, to get your heart ready to receive the presence of God into your life in a fuller way right now during this hour. To put aside your doubts, if you have those. To be open to the possibility that God has a, an amazing plan for your life in this world. Sarah got up every morning with a purpose to glorify God, to pray, to serve God, to serve people, serve her family, serve Shalom, serve people in the community, serve in the church. And she didn't quit until God said, it's time's up. And we have that same opportunity. Some, someone said to me recently, I want to be more like Sarah. And the response truly is no. Sarah was trying to be like Jesus and she, was, she had found her identity in Christ by receiving him into her life, receiving life and forgiveness. We are invited to find our identity in Christ, to be more like him, and to find our purpose in him. Some verses to get us started as we worship. Um, selections from Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. But if Christ is in you, and you didn't know Sarah more than a minute or two, and you knew that Christ was in her, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. It's a righteousness that's given to us by, by Jesus because of what he did for us, not because of what we do. We could say, well, Sarah lives such a good life. She'll be in heaven. No, not because she lived a good life. She's, we don't get to compare her to us or to anybody. She and we are all compared to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We receive that only from him, that righteousness that comes by faith. And if the spirit of him who has raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, 
He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. The creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom that is that the freedom and glory of the children of God. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. True enough. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Just one more verse, and then we're going to pray. Um, Christmas, of course, was special to, to Sarah. <laughs> like, that's understatement. Um, her favorite Christmas verse is John 1, 14. It's not part of the Christmas story per se, but it goes like this in the, in the New International. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That Jesus, who is God himself, would choose to become flesh like we are and dwell among us just thrilled Sarah. We have seen his glory, it says, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The, the trick to this is that her favorite verse really was a paraphrase in the message. John 1, 14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. He moved into the neighborhood and we saw his glory with our own eyes. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, how do we say thanks for Sarah? We are so grateful to have shared life with her. She lived the life of Jesus as best as she could with passion and desire for each person to find wholeness in Jesus Christ. And she lived by faith, not by sight. And we can't imagine what it would be like to close our eyes and wake up in your presence, but sh there she is. And here we are left to pick up pieces. And we hear your calling to carry on, to be faithful, to find our life in Jesus. And we're so grateful for that that it wasn't just something that Sarah did better than anybody else, but it's something that we all can do and have and live according to. Thank you for receiving Jesus, for receiving Sarah, Jesus, into your very presence in heaven. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. She has joined a great cloud of witnesses. People like her beloved husband, Glenn, grandson, Logan, and many others. She has joined the great cloud of witnesses of those who have found their life in Jesus Christ. We glorify you we thank you and we praise you as we worship. We give you our heart, we give you our tears, our thoughts and our memories. Please comfort us by your mercy. In Christ we pray, amen. Sarah loved music, loved, loved, loved music. And so uh, when we had to select songs it was hard to figure out which ones <laughs> so we selected uh, a couple of hymns and and that was kind of easy
but a newer song that we're going to start with is something that when when Sarah heard this song, she, you know how she would get, just, oh, this is awesome. <laughs> this song is awesome. So we, we're going to sing the goodness of God. Would you all stand together with me if you're able to do so? I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been building your heart. From the moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. The goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in the darkest nights. You are close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. I have been the goodness of God. The goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after. Running after me, your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after. goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Of the goodness of God, and I will sing of the goodness of God. Right. Yeah. When I come to the garden alone, while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear 
falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and He walks with me, and He talks with me, and He tells The joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Well, he speaks, and the sound of his voice is so sweet that the birds hush their singing, and the melody that he gave. is ringing and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other is ever known the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Amen. On a hill far away stood that old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest stand back for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I cherish. going to invite our uh, friends of the, or the family up here momentarily to, to play with guitar, uh, violin, and congas, um, uh, a wonderful song that we're all very familiar with.
Wow. That was awesome. Thank you, guys. That was really awesome. In John 12, Jesus spoke these words. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Good afternoon. My name is Lon, uh, director of Shalom and great friend of Sarah Collison. I wish we didn't have to be here today. But since we are, I'm glad we're all together. And certainly that's Sarah's life is just togetherness, family living through everything together. All family in Christ. In a few moments, Sarah's sons, Dan and Mike, are going to share some thoughts and memories with you. But before that, I'd like to, to share some details and observations from the last 24 hours of her life. This is rather unusual for me, but it was a rather unusual um, events. Um, that being said, it wasn't because Sarah's last 24 hours were unusual for her. In fact, it was quite an ordinary day for her. <laughs> but in the ordinariness of that day, I'd like to show you some things that I saw. This past Wednesday, Sarah um, had a CPR training that she had to go to, and she wanted Julie to go with her. And as usual, Julie was juggling five million things and, and uh, was like, oh, she tried to get out of going. But Sarah, if you know her, she can be quite persuasive. I don't think I've gotten out of anything <laughs> that I've tried to get out of. I've tried to get out of some stuff. <laughs> um, after Sarah's death, Julie and I were talking, and, and Julie remembered how Sarah had thanked her multiple times that day on the way home for, for coming with her. And, and she had also, as she does a lot, was just expressed how grateful she was to be in, in the place where she was, her, her home, overlooking the Shalom farm and with Julie right next door and with a view of the Woolery beyond. Just, just cr truly, Sarah Collison was one of the most grateful people that I have ever known. After Sarah returned home from that training on Wednesday, um, Keith Lohman and I met with her for prayer and Tom Hermanette usually is there with us he couldn't be there that day hi Tom um, and, and we meet we, we've done this for nine years we meet together for, for a prayer to talk about our Shalom worship that month and, um, and so we we met together just like any other time we met in the glory room which by the way, is named after 1 Corinthians 10, 31 that says, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. It would remind her every day that that's why she lived. As usual, cookies and treats and, and drinks were all laid out for us and we came into the house w with hugs and laughter and, and, and the smell of candles burning and, and treats and everything, the, just the warmest welcome you can ever imagine. And if you know her, you know exactly what I mean. Sarah was truly one of the most hospitable people I have ever known. Keith and I and Tom had been doing this long enough where we knew the drill. We would not be starting our prayer meeting right away. First, Sarah would talk about whatever rabbit trail came to her mind in the moment. 
And, and truly, there were many days where half of our prayer meeting was spent on Sarah's rabbit trails. At first, this drove me crazy. But I learned that this was Sarah. And I learned to accept her and, and love her and enjoy her way of expressing herself with passion and energy about any and every subject that she was talking about. Of course, testimonies were her specialty. And, and her smile, oh, her smile. Indeed, Sarah was truly one of the most relational people I have ever known. When we got around to the purpose of our meeting, which was what did God want to say to Shalom that month, typically Keith and I would kind of look at each other and shrug our shoulders. We, I don't know, maybe we should pray about it. And Sarah would be like, oh, but God revealed this to me this morning, and, and this was in the Bible, and I just read this, and, and this is awesome, and, and what about this? Every time. I soon learned that Sarah was a walking Bible, truly. And, and I also learned kind of early on, which was awesome, that Sarah had a prophetic gift. And, and what I mean by that is that she truly had a gift of sharing God's word to people. And more, more often than not, we would go through our whole prayer meeting and talk and discuss, all of us, and, and we'd end up doing what Sarah said. <laughs> because we believed it was from God. Sarah was truly one of the most prophetic people that I have ever known. And I believe her prophetic gift was due to a couple of different things. One, her incredibly close relationship with Jesus Christ. Just, I mean, close. And her undying devotion to the Word of God. Which, by the way, the Word of God was right there in her lap as she passed, if you did not know that. This past Wednesday, Wednesday Sarah was just as animated as she ever was, and, and immediately she, she felt that we needed to know something. <laughs> we've got, I wrote this down, we've got to talk about new beginnings, seed planting, new harvest. And as we discussed and prayed, we landed on the scripture from John 12. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Wow. You may have recently received the Shalom newsletter in your mail. I hope you did. If you didn't, please see me. Or I think we have some out here. Um, probably six or eight weeks ago, Sarah approached me. She said, Lon, I have an article that I have to write for the newsletter. I've got, I've got to write this, le this article. And just so you know, that is very unusual. Sarah does not write articles for the newsletter, hardly, never that I've known of. I'm sure she has before, but I've got to write this, this article. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll write it down. I, and I did. And, and if you haven't read the article, please read it. Find it and read it. I'll get it to you. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to summarize quickly. She wrote how she remembered how she and Glenn had prayed 35 years before over the, the space where the new Woolery building is, how they had prayed and asked God about his vision for Shalom. What will you do here? Asked him for a barn. <laughs> And then as she went on in the article, she reflected on how fast forwarding to 2012 when Glenn lay dying, she pleaded with God for her partner. How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to fulfill my call without my partner? And, and God gave Sarah this text, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. 
And then she heard from the Lord, I will give you the partners that you need. Fast forward a little bit. She concluded her article by sharing that at the recent Woolery Building dedication service, she looked around and saw all these people who had come to partner with her to fulfill God's calling. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. What God had shown Sarah was that her calling was bigger than just her and Glenn. With God's help, Sarah could carry out the calling she had received with the partners that God would provide. Friends, with the building and the dedication of the new Shalom Woolery Sheep Barn through the help of all these partners, God's promise to her was fulfilled. And Sarah got to see it. That's crazy. None of us knew it yet, but Sarah's work on earth was, was complete. She did everything God asked her to do. Her, her, life, her life is the greatest example of following call of anyone I've ever known. Read her book if you haven't. The last word God gave Sarah the day she died was new beginnings. She has a new beginning. <laughs> we have a new beginning. New beginning, seed planting, new harvest. What will, what will come <laughs> from Sarah's life? The last text we read, probably in my, I believe only minutes or hours after Keith and I left, we believe she died with her Bible in hand. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. Our great friend, Sarah Collison, has gone home. Her life has produced many seeds. And if we are faithful to God and if we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, as she did, watch out, people, because God is going to multiply 30, 60, 100 fold. What a great legacy! Sarah and Glenn Collison and the Collison family. What a great legacy. May it be so that we are her seeds and we are multiplied over and over again to God be the glory. Amen. Thank you, Lon. And thank you, Haven Reformed Church. I'm Dan Collison. The second born and middle child of Glenn and Sarah Collison. And I will admit, uh, middle children are a strange lot. We are usually stereotyped as moody, unpredictable, rebellious, emotionally scarred, because we are the second to the oldest in experience and privilege, while typically being treated more shrewdly by our parents than the youngest. And for a long list of odd reasons, I actually never fit that mold. And I believe it's because of mom, who was also an atypical middle child. She was, and I have become, more driven than moody, emotionally charged more than scarred, and without question, predictable to an irritating degree. And yet, to mom's credit and inspiration, even the irritating parts are typically motivated by an enduring love and passion for family and for service and for community and for church and, of course, for God. I will miss mom's passion for celebrating birthdays. 
Uh, only a few days ago, I'm not really sure when she sent it, but my spouse, Holly, received a loving and affirming birthday card from mom in the mail. And what an amazing mother-in-law she was to Holly and to other daughters-in-laws and sons-in-laws. And mom's personalized cards were as predictable as the sun rising and setting. Uh, birthdays. My brother Mike and sister Julie, when we were children, she would create the most bodacious and hand-sculpted peanut butter, butterscotch, rice crispy cakes, smothered in chocolate and fully molded to visualize our passion nearby. These were, these were not curated like wedding cakes, right? They were slabs that you could dig into and cut into. And, and with the other kids, sometimes entire classes from our school, our elementary schools were invited to invade these cakes. But they were always shaped. When I was into baseball, it was a baseball. When I was into football, it was a football. When I was into drums, it was a drum. And it was really amazing to just be enveloped by her intentionality. Now, I will admit, later in life, she pivoted to these cards and streams of endless emojis and texts and the phone call every year. And on the more predictable, irritating side, she reminded me annually about the drama surrounding my birth. She just felt like she needed to replay it every single time. And I'm guessing it's not typical for most people to be annually reminded of the specific and gory details of a difficult childbirth that no teenage boy, let alone adult man, wants to know he brought upon his mother. But I'll gladly overlook that. I even said that when I'm listening to it for the 10th or 15th time. I'm like, Christmas is coming, so we'll just move beyond this birthday. I'll gladly overlook that because of how mom celebrated Christmas all year long. And she loved to make Christmas the most celebrated family experience and community experience of the year. When we were children in early September... She would start harvesting all possible needs that us kids would have and turn them into presents because you could wrap socks and underwear and deodorant and toothbrushes so that it was a pile on Christmas Day. Now, that wasn't to the exclusion of usually a very thoughtful primary gift that was researched, and I am certain a financial stretch for mom and dad, but it was glorious. And it wasn't just for us. Mom lived in community with adults, facing disabilities nearly her entire adult life, and with my father, and Christmas was a joy for everyone. Everyone. One of the beloved residents who Mom lived in community with at Ottawa County Community Haven, which was a county-owned farm for 60 adults, and at the homestead for many years, posted on Facebook when I posted a, a, a notice of Mom's passing. She said, uh, she just said that it was always the best Christmases that she had. And she wrote, you should have seen the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. I actually think that it might be appropriate that mom passed through the veil to her eternal rest during the Christmas season. And I'm guessing that she was probably greeted by Glenn and a fully lit tree and a massive Christmas village that dad has been building for 10 years whether he liked it or not. <laughs> now, there were a few moments of mom's spiritual and Christian faith uh, that went beyond the celebrations and went beyond the incredible joy that you've seen to be her and I sort of gristing and grinding over things we maybe disagree. One really interesting moment was when uh, I did give her a, a full fail at, at something that, that I was a pastor in, in Kalamazoo, uh, Faith Reformed Church, and we had a prayer retreat, which did have talking at the beginning and at the end. So it wasn't like you couldn't talk, uh, but, but we gathered to go into more contemplative and meditative prayer. Uh, it was a retreat. She wanted to do it. She was so excited. And uh, the night went fine. We got ready. And the next morning, as we're heading out to walk out and have time alone with God, I happened to see her pick up my wife Holly and say, you're ready for breakfast so we can catch up? <laughs> that was an F for the prayer retreat. And yet it really reflected upon her gregarious and externalized love for family and neighbors and God. And she admits that was just not maybe her best way to pray. She was, though, unflinchingly consistent in her ability to see God in all things and 
difference, identity difference, difference of opinion as this sort of sacred identity and entrustment. I mean, from the first time I heard my mother's voice to the last time I spoke with her only about a week ago, I have had at least a few moments of, of her commenting, of her love for the creator of all things and Christ, our redeemer, and how she experienced the leading and love of God in her day-to-day -day experiences. And one of the ultimate outcomes of that love, and that for which I am personally and professionally, I've been changed forever, was mom's deep belief between people that between people, particularly between able-bodied and disabled-bodied bodies, there is no difference in our humanity, even as there are physical differences in our being. And mom's thinking and her theology resonated with a book titled Vulnerable Communion that said this, full personhood is neither diminished by disability nor confirmed by ability. Instead, it is a factor of the interdependent relationships we share with one another as creatures loved into being by God and the image of God. Now, what I loved about mom, potentially most about mom, was her relentless pursuit to ensure that this theology of difference, of wholeness, regardless of our physical state, and her faith and love just never left things in the abstract or with words. She put them into action, meaningfully and often. Safe housing, relational community, meaningful programs, faith-based care, the homesteads, shalom. And yes, even Christmas on steroids, she did it all. And she's one of the people that changed the world for the better in her time and place. And that is what I admire, and that is what I reach for. As a, a man who seeks to follow God, that seeks to serve community and do so every day. Well, Mom, you were an original. You were our children's, your children's biggest cheerleaders, my biggest cheerleader. Thank you for being the passionate soul you were I will miss you the remaining days of my life until I meet you again. I love you, Mom. Well, my name is Michael, and I was the first to be cradled in the arms of Sarah and Glenn here in uh, their Kalamazoo bungalow. And mom would regularly recount to me with the whole birth stories, well, your first steps, you didn't walk. You just grabbed a pencil and ran. Like, okay, I know, mom, okay, you tell me every year. Uh, that's the legend. And our family's powerful chemical, colostosterone, um, <laughs> it most assuredly had its greatest genetic contribution from my mother's side. Thank you, Mom. <laughs> well, my mom wasn't as perhaps frenetic as me. Um, she had her own way of running, not walking. Well, Mom's expansive, unique personhood, it found its most powerful realization in her collaborative life with my father, Glenn. Truly a team, they possessed complementary gifts, skills, and personalities that made each other better. Curbing the extremes, sharing the work. They were a team of community builders. And mom and dad created a legacy of love outwardly expressed. Well, a little Mike, Dan, and Julie ran around Conklin, our small town, and sat in the weathered oak pews of our small church and lived above that small grocery store of our childhood, Collison's Food Store, Mom was using her training as a registered nurse, doing caregiving in home and at an elder care facility. Even with full-time nursing work, her helping with the store, staying fully connected and committed to her church family, she still managed to orchestrate and direct special events, meals, family projects. And as that Christmas was that season, one of the most etched memories for me was the year that mom dialed it up with cookies 
and candy goodie plates for a lot of people. I mean, 50 plus for at least a week. The whole kitchen is just, it's just a wreck. I mean, there's peanut brittle, there's this hard candy with all the flavors and cookies of all kinds. I mean, it's just like a manufacturing plant. Sweatshop for me and my brother and my sister. And just, you know, putting together bundle after bundle, the list. She's like, oh, we gotta add some more people. We gotta add some more people. And it all culminated, like Christmas Eve, we needed to deliver these. And so we're like, come on, it's Christmas Eve. Like, you're putting us to work. Like, you go deliver those to the widows. You're going to go deliver those to the widows in town. So a very not cheerfully spirited uh, older brother uh, dragging the sled and the little snowsuits and, you know, Julian, I think we even had the dog in tow. You know, we tromped around like it's cold and snowy and dark and knocking on doors like, here's a plate of cookies, Merry Christmas. You know, like, like you get out there and you go deliver those. <laughs> like, so, so, you know, for me that was, there's, there's just a, there's a host of, of, uh, of, of memories of mom directing and orchestrating projects, you know, meals and fundraisers and, you know, just always seem to have the gift of extending the opportunity. You know what I'm saying. The road from Collison's Food Store in Conklin to Ottawa County Community Haven in Eastmanville was only 13 miles away. But it was a far grander adventure that was there. And this is where mom and dad discovered their life's work. It all came together. I grew up in a large group home. And I used to joke, like, yeah, I grew up in a home. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> like, what? Like, well, you know, it was kind of unique. My mom's office was at the front door of our supersized home that held 60 residents, and we had an apartment off the back. Her command center was the last thing I saw before heading off to school, and the first thing I saw on the return. That pot of coffee just going to town, always full <laughs> and rolling. Sometimes we'd come home and just have to duck around the back, <laughs> exit and kind of. You know, got to watch, don't want to go by mom's office. So uh, after nearly a decade of managing the county farm, and, and they just, they loved it. They were like, this is just wonderful, using her gifts in nursing and administration and managing it and dad managing the farm. It was a surprise that it all, it all came to an end. And against what they were thinking and dreaming and imagining, it just ended. And so the impossible, what they believed wasn't really possible, was a more beautiful and expansive work for caring for the development of the disabled in and through what was to become the homestead, Shalom, the Shalom Network. They had no idea that there was something bigger and more beautiful. They lamented losing the haven. And that time there, and oh, it was amazing, you know, and they just, they couldn't imagine that there was something bigger and greater, but there was. And I have the deepest admiration for my mom, who shattered by dad's passing in 2012, she spent her final last decade, like Lon was saying, continuing the ministry legacy that was begun during their partnership, while collaborating with many new friends to complete the work. What a profound example she offers from beauty from ashes. She was fiercely loyal and unfailingly faithful in her commitments to God and all that she had opportunity to love on. And there were many. She made friends everywhere she went. I like this little phrase from a Rich Mullins song, talking about, thinking about mom and dad's 40 plus years together. Talk about your miracles. Talk about your faith. They worked to give faith hands and feet and somehow gave it wings. Well, mom was a prime mover in challenging and supporting the educational and vocational work of my own lifetime. The music, the music degree from college, the youth ministry, the pastoral work, later in life, the sales work. They were all enthusiastically championed by mom. Nobody cheered louder than her. Now, I get that mothers are often prone to gushing about their kids, but I tell you, my mother, she had another gear when it came to effusive encouragement. You, you went to the top, and then you went over the top. 
In 1999, after I completed a self-published collection of stories and devotional thoughts, mom became my top promoter and distributor. At one point she asked, can you just leave me a case of books? And she got them all gone, and I'm, there's people in this room, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands. I mean, <laughs> it, so she was out there promoting, it was wonderful. And two decades later, I had the honor of contributing to and writing the introduction to her own book. She was truly my greatest writing fan, and though I sometimes pushed back at her wildly exuberant words of praise, come on, mom, let's be realistic, this is just small potatoes. She, <laughs> she saw and offered unbridled possibilities at every turn. She didn't see small things, even in small things. And that was remarkable. And I know many of you can share your own experience with hearing what she saw and what she offered, the unbridled possibilities she saw in your life. Can I get an amen? Well, here was another gift bestowed to me and my siblings. She and dad made visible what a fully integrated work and life might look like and might offer. So we saw and lived out through a thorough and complete integration of paying the bills and building a career while still within the boundaries of our home. This is a very unique situation, although things lately have gotten people a little more integrated at home with their work, right? Um, we lived above our store that we own. We lived in an apartment adjoining the facility. We lived in a group home. We worked, played, ate meals in communal spaces that were tied by relationships to so many. Even in retirement, mom lived in a loft with a central view from the upper deck overlooking the daily workings of the homestead in Shalom. Finger on the pulse, finger on the pulse. Having first experienced this at home, all of us kids have built our own lives deeply integrated with work and vocation, which is interesting. Um, Dan and Julie ran their own group homes and lived out that experience there. Uh, I and Dan, having pastoral ministry, um, that's a very integrated work vocation. Uh, and I, now later in life, uh, working, working out of home and on the road, out and about, uh, doing foundation repair and also building hand percussion. It's just all connected. It's all connected. And we learned that and experienced it there first. Now at the heart of the greatest gifts we were given by mom, it was the safety net of unconditional love. The safety net of unconditional love that allowed us to explore, risk, try, build, you knew it was safe. Mom's entrepreneurial spirit was compassionate, and it was people-focused, born and bound of the call to the most important calling she held. Love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, and all your soul, and all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. This was what was under it all. Well, Mom modeled the daily spiritual practices and disciplines that mark my life. Her daily time of scripture and prayer, it was the oxygen of her daily life, frankly. The tracks of her relationship with her maker, they're underlined, they're highlighted in her Velveteen Bible and her devotional books. Most of our conversations would inevitably somehow land around at least a reference or a piece of spiritual daily bread that she had partaken of, she offered me, and she offered all of us, the faith, hope, and the love that she possessed. And she just gave it out. She had it because of that time she spent sitting with the Word of God in prayer and in solitude. With a supernatural capacity, Mom was a spiritual partner, mentor, and friend to many. Every step of the way, she used her remarkable gift of gathering and building community. She was still making ministry notes and plans on her last day on this earth. Well, somewhere along our life together, there was a simple nickname greeting that evolved between my mom and I. I would enthuse, hello, mumsy. 
as if, and as if I was the only and most important person in the world, she would cheer back, oh, sunny boy, sunny boy. That was always, you know, I, I don't even remember how it started, but it, it just became the thing. And then those greeting cards and Christmas cards, you know, mumsy, sunny boy, like it, it, all, it all followed. Well, Mom, until we are together again, with faces unveiled, in the presence of the pure, uncontained love of God, Thank you for showing me and all of us the way. Amen. When the time comes and I'm standing at the river that separates the two worlds that I love, torn between my precious friends and my family and the place of peace that's waiting up above.
say a special thank you to Brendan Quartz. Uh, thank you. He put together this slideshow for us, and, and in fact, uh, when we go into the great room, there's going to be a, a way extended version of that, uh, including some videos of Sarah talking. So, Brendan, who stayed up till 2 a.m. last night for us, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. That's, that is truly awesome. So, uh, we're going to have prayer and a benediction here, um, but after we do, what's going to happen is uh, I'm going to invite the family to exit first, and then they're going to go into the great room for the luncheon. We'll, um, we'll wait just a few minutes as, as Leah plays some piano music and, and let them get in there, and then I'll release the rest of us to go in there to the luncheon. Our prayer now will serve as the prayer before the meal, so please just go in there and, and get going on things, okay? Uh, let, let, us, let us pray together. Father in heaven and our great Savior, Jesus, we are so glad that Sarah is fully in your presence now. What, what a... What a, we cannot imagine what she is experiencing right now. So awesome. Everything that she longed for and hoped for, she's with you. Face to face. Oh. We are so grateful that you called her and gave her such a great purpose in life. To love you with all her heart and to love people. We are thankful for all that we have learned from her and will continue to reflect on. Bring to mind, Lord, all the times that she expressed gratitude and was hospitable and, and built into relationships and community, especially with you and, and, and devotion to your word. Thank you for her great faith and her, her response to your calling. Just a, a hero of the faith. May we remember these great lessons, Lord, help us to remember them and carry on her great legacy following hard after Jesus. We ask that you would minister to the family and all of us as we grieve her loss and yet rejoice in her home going. We pray all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. Now receive this benediction. And she would have killed me if I didn't do this. From Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. And ever, amen. Collison family, you are invited to exit to the great room. Love you guys. Please remain seated until I dismiss you. <laughs>